God's Way Meeting – All presentations, seminars or discussions with informal or informal meetings arranged by directors or members of God's Way Limited. The title of this meeting is Members' Questions About God's Way, during which the directors of God's Way Limited ask Jesus to be a guest speaker at the 2018 annual general meeting. But before he delivers his primary presentation, he answers questions about the future of the God's Way Limited organization for the members on behalf of the directors. The meeting was recorded on the 14th of February 2018 at 11 a.m. in Mount Coulomb, Queensland, Australia. So it's all pretty interesting, hey? Or all pretty boring, depending on which way you look at this whole election thing. Um, but I think what, our, what the company is going to be doing over the next year is going to be pretty interesting. And, uh, and it's pretty exciting to be involved in it, I think, in its inception. Um, given the fact there's a whole heap of new things that will be happening this year. And uh, also, obviously, a whole heap of systems that we're trying to get in place this year as well. So that's going to be really good. But, um, and probably what I'd like to do first is uh, answer any of your questions you might have about any of those things and get those questions out of the way. Because after that, I would like to talk to you about a subject that I feel is probably the most important subject to talk to you about with regard to your participation in God's way. So I'm basically giving you the opportunity right now to ask as many questions you want about the different programs we've got, the different branches we've got at the moment, the external branches that are getting operational are the construction branch, you've got the human life branch and the environment branch. Um, they are the main branches at the moment that are, that are underway. And and the internal branches that are underway are to do with information sharing, the finance and accounting side of things as well. But, um, oh, and, the, and, and of course the uh, volunteer support uh, branch as well, which, which is to do with sort of basically, hopefully, chain training new volunteers. Now, so, some of you have been involved with that program. Obviously, Tristan and Eloisa have because they developed it. And obviously our three new attendees that have been invited have uh, gone through that program as well. Some of the rest of you haven't gone through that program. And one thing we'd recommend to you all that you all go through the program at some point, just as a bit of an exercise to, to see, you know, it's interesting to see the responses that people have to specific tasks they've been given to see how suitable they're going to be in the long run to, to serving people, you know, to giving the gift of their love to people. So if you'd like to ask any questions about any of those branches, I'm happy to uh, answer those questions now, but then I'd like to talk to you about another subject after that. So any questions that you have about them? No? Okay, you'd like to ask? At this stage, is there anything in another part of the world or it's all just starting here for is anything happening overseas? We've had many inquiries from overseas people who want to set up learning centres in different places. And there are some of those you know, places that we're following through on the inquiries with at the moment in Sweden, for example. Um, and there has been some inquiries of, from people in the United States as well. The, the problem at this stage is that there's not enough documentation that's publicly available to explain to them properly what a learning centre is actually going to do. And so while they've read the constitution of the organisation, they don't really get or understand to a large degree, you know, what's going to be personally involved if they actually are going to be running a centre. So what we're trying to do is encourage some of those people who have actually uh, made those inquiries or who are talking with us about those specific things to come to Australia and visit us for a period of time so that we can actually sit down and have conversations with them about those particular, uh, you know, the particular requirements of running a centre. And we're also, you can see also why our managing director, Mary, has focused her attention on uh, trying to get as much of this documentation, this formal documentation, uh, present, presented publicly. 
because without it being presented publicly, people who are interested don't know what they're really in a, to a degree interested in, you know. They're interested in the idea and the concept, but they don't really know what to do about that idea or concept and what is going to revolve from them. So um, there are many, um, many requirements that need to be met first before some of these places, which have already, you know, some people uh, uh, want their places to become sort of a learning centre overseas, but before they can, they really need to know what's going to be completely involved in that process. And obviously, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure with overseas that would need to be set up. Here in Australia, we've had to incorporate a company. And, and obviously, that would also be necessary in every other place where there's a learning centre. Every one of those companies has uh, obviously ongoing recurring expenses. And um, if there are not enough funds to pay for the recurring expenses of those particular companies, then ob obviously we can't set them up. So there are logistical issues as well as practical issues associated with what the people themselves know and understand as regards what are the roles of a, of a centre and what part they would play in, the, in that. But that all being said, there's plenty of keen people. It's just the structures need to be done. And this is why our directors uh, this year are focusing a lot of their attention on structure. And so while you might not see a lot of, uh, you know, other things happening, although that's not strictly true either. For uh, At this stage, we've been eight members and we've accomplished a great deal this year. Uh, just those eight members have accomplished a great deal this year. We've done, uh, I think, a good 20 or so environmental programs. And um, we've, we've also, you know, tr you've heard from Tristan uh, today, one of the directors about the, uh, you know, human life programs uh, that have already been experimented with. Uh, you can see from the plans that you will be given as a part of your package uh, that were given to all members that we're also working on sort of plans for the construction uh, side of things this year. So, and that's notwithstanding all of the developmental stuff that uh, Barb and Kate and myself have been working on behind the scenes to get all the structures in place. So there's a, a, a large amount of things that have been done this year. Um, and if you compare, if you look at what's been done this year and say, well, that whole lot's just been done by eight, eight people, basically, um, it's quite, quite a lot of work that's been done by eight people. That all being said, of course, um, you know, the more members we have, the more we're going to be able to accomplish and also the more uh, people in, overseas become involved, the more we are to also accomplish in the long run. But it's very, very important that we have the internal infrastructure and the internal financial structure to handle uh, new places overseas set, getting set up. And at this stage, um, we also need an auditor in place who's willing to travel to those countries and actually oversee the setting up of these particular centres to ensure that they're done in the way the constitution stipulates. And that is our main problem at this stage. At this stage, uh, the only two auditors available to us are Mary and myself, which means that every new thing that comes online, Mary and myself have to audit those particular things, have to go through, is this happening in harmony with the constitution? And if it's not, then of course we need to deal with that in some way. Obviously down the track, the key is to get more qualified people to be auditors who, who understand in their heart the constitution and understand what the goal is. And those particular people then would become the people who would help other people overseas go through the entire process of setting up an organisation, setting up the constitution of that organisation to match the country of origin, and then working through the issues of property and so forth with those people, ownership and all these kind of things, to get to a point where the organisation in those particular locations owns the property that we're then working with. Does that make sense? So it's going to be a, uh, a, a, it's going to take time, obviously, for those things to occur. And, and, and in a way, um, it leads me to the conversation I'm going to have with you in my next, in my next thing as well, in, in the next discussion I'll have with you. So I'll show you how it leads to that when we have that discussion. Does that make sure. sense? Yeah. Any other questions you guys have? That's a good question, Kel. Um, thanks, Kate.
I just was curious about how that would work from an organisational point of view. Like, would each country, it would, it would need to have its own organisation, like company? Yes, but it would probably be a subsidiary of the Australian company, uh, at least initially. Uh, we need to ensure that the anything that's set up as from the Gosway organisation is actually very close to the constitution uh, or the exact same constitution that we currently have. And uh, obviously different countries have different rules with regard to incorporation. And, uh, and although that is the case, a majority of the countries have very similar rules. They allow for similar kinds of organisations to be set up. It's just a matter of going through the process of doing that in the specific countries involved. And, and working through that to a solution. But that does require somebody on the ground mm -hmm. who is actually following the rules. And because we can't be confident of that at this stage without there being an auditor in place, mm -hmm. then of course the auditor would play a major role in that. And uh, obviously myself and Mary don't have the time to do that at this stage. So it, it's really not possible until we get some more auditors who are able and are in the condition to do those things. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of setting up organisations, I've already done that uh, on, in other countries before. So I know what's involved in some of those countries. And, uh, and you know, obviously we'd need some, potentially need some legal help uh, in those particular countries as well. Now, all of that costs money. And obviously we've got to now, at this stage, ask ourselves, well, the first thing we need to do is use our funds to make sure the Australian side of everything is working properly and functioning properly and is doing what we want it to do. And once that is stable, and that might take a few years, I feel that to buy then, uh, there will be a lot of information available to people overseas about how they can set up a similar kind of thing. And there'll also be, some of you may be available to be auditors to make sure that it actually works and happens in the way that it should. Um, and then, then we're ready to do that overseas. Make sense? And would the members be, would it be just all members of God's Way or would they be members of the like subsidiary company? Um, well, it, it depends on the international ownership laws as to what they would be members of. But highly likely they'd be members of God's Way here if that was possible. Mm. If that was not possible, there's logistical issues with that. Obviously, whenever we have an AGM, um, members have to put in their votes. And, and if we have a lot of uh, postal voting, uh, obviously it's going to be a bit of a nightmare when it comes to the AGMs. Um, so, you know, obviously there are logistical issues that need to be sorted out with regard to that as well. And, and to be frank, I don't think the organisation is ready for any of those things at this stage because you haven't got yet, as yet, your major structures up and, and in place. So, you know, once, once we're ready, then that's the time to examine that issue. There are keen people overseas, but when I say they're keen, they don't really know what they're keen about. No, they don't really know what's involved and they don't really know the cost of what's involved either. And so when I say that they're keen, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to translate into actual, you know, putting their life where, you know, into it sort of thing, which is what is in the end going to be required for anybody who really sets up the whole thing overseas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Connie, thanks. For, for overseas people, would they have to have their own volunteer selection program up and running first too to get members or would they have to come here and maybe see what this one's like, become a member and then incorporate it there? <laughs> yes, what, what we would probably like for people who are interested overseas is that, is that they firstly uh, do the volunteer selection program. This will help them understand uh, quite a lot of what will be involved for them in the future. When it comes to setting up something overseas, what we're first trying to do here is getting core people here who are willing to travel overseas to help those people set up their particular programs. So, but, but that requires the people here being experienced enough to and, and able to go overseas and actually do that for those particular people in those particular countries. So there will be a process that we're going through and what we're recommending to all people overseas that are interested that they first do the volunteer selection program here, then they'll have a good idea what's involved in terms of volunteering. And then uh, we can also provide some 
education with them if they're still interested in some organising and organisational education to them. And uh, many people can stay for a period of up to two years. It just depends on their particular personal situation. And at the moment, the directors are actually working through with government agencies what are the options for people to stay for a period of time from overseas here in Australia so that they can get some hands-on experience about all the different facets of, of the organisation that they're not going to need to be concerned about. And once they've got that few years of education, now they might be ready for setting up their, you know, something in their own country. And, uh, and then under those circumstances, we, uh, as our, our members here, will provide support and so initially, they might not have the people to do a volunteer selection program, so we would send over to them a couple of people to do the program for them and so forth and show them and educate them about how to do that program. And then, you know, after that program has happened, they'll start getting some volunteers, obviously, and then those volunteers will get educated in the same way that you are going to be educated through a training, through training programs. Yeah. So it's going to be a progressive process. Uh, it's not going to be something where people are going to just go, oh, I, I'm interested, and we go, yeah, no worries, and, you know, and, and that's all done and dusted. It's not like that at all. It has to be set up properly, and in particular, it has to be audited in the right way so that we're sure that the people who are doing, who are responsible are people who are sincerely interested in doing things God's way rather than just sincerely interested in doing things their own way. And, uh, and, that, and that can be easily determined if we follow this chain of events that I've just described. You can easily see where, where, where a person's heart is in that process. So that's why they're going to be going through that kind of process. So before a person could really set it up overseas, they probably would need to have done the pro volunteer selection program here. And, uh, and they would also need to have a couple of years of experience here working with all of the teams here to get some exposure as to what's involved. And then they will have enough information uh, to understand what's going on now. In some cases, they might not be able to work with the teams so much, um, and we will have to work out what we're going to do under those circumstances. But um, there are some people already, like Courtney, who, have, who are slated for the next uh, volunteer selection program, who is doing that for that reason. She's doing the pollen program. She's staying for a couple of years. She wants to do the uh, training programs that we develop over that time. And, uh, and after that period of time, she'll have a good idea about what's going to be involved setting it, setting it up somewhere else. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Any more questions about those things? Yeah. Yeah. So, so with any organization, you've got to walk before you run, right? Mm -hmm. And usually you've got to crawl before you walk. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and so, you know, that's what it's going to be like for us over the coming years. We're going to have to go through this process. And this is why many of the things that your directors are trying to direct you to do are essential parts, because without the documentation and without the training programs and without the volunteer selection program and so forth, uh, many of these things can't really happen in a, in a bigger picture. Yeah. You can also see that they're setting up overseas, uh, setting up an organisation as, as the people who have done it for this one re have now realised it's quite a costly uh, uh, experience in terms of time and effort and, and finances. And, uh, and obviously, you know, God's way doesn't need property in order to be God's way, but it does help because it gives us a place to do programs. Um, but the reality is you can, you can set up an organisation that doesn't need to have a property of its own in order to do, give gifts to the world. But where do you do all your experiments and how do you control those experiments? So, you know, obviously having a property does help. And the other thing we need to consider too is that if you do set up an organisation overseas where there is no property involved, um, then what is the face, what, what's the purpose of that? No, there's no face there that people can visit and see things in operation. You're better off spending that money making sure there's something here in Australia that people can visit and see the operation of. And so uh, the directors are going to make decisions based on the finances available to them and also based upon the 
underlying uh, priorities that they feel are important at the time. And at this stage, the directors feel that the priorities are, let's get Australia, God's way sorted over the next year or two. And uh, after that, we can look more seriously at helping other people overseas do the same thing, but, but only if there is a deep passion and a demonstrable passion that they are going to follow God's way. Mm -hmm. otherwise, otherwise, it's just going to turn into a, an organisation of, you know, that's the same as any other organisation. So that's not much good. Mm. Mm. That's good. All right. Are there any more questions here? Okay. No? Okay.